Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. It is good to be together. I know a lot of people are traveling this weekend, but it is nice for us to be here together, both online and in person. If you are new with us this morning, if you're here for the first time, we welcome you. And if you need restrooms, they're in the building across the breezeway on the left. If you need anything else, just grab somebody nearby you. I'm sure they'll be able to help. Today we are entering into the presence of God as we do every week, ready to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to us, ready to receive the grace and mercy and love and forgiveness of God. So I invite you all to take a deep breath, to make yourself comfortable in your space, to uh, center yourself for a moment, and to be ready to receive all that God has for you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. you. Please stand as we sing our opening hymn, verses 1 through 3. God, with all your faithful followers of every age, we praise you, the rock of our lives. Be our strong foundation and form us into the body of your Son that we may gladly minister to all the world through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the lesson. The first lesson this morning is from the 15th chapter of Jeremiah. O Lord, you know, remember me and visit me, and bring down retribution for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance, do not take me away. Know that on your account I suffer insult. 
Your words were found and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of merrymakers, nor did I rejoice under the weight of your hand I sat alone, for you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Truly you are to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fall. Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you turn back, I will take you back, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall serve as my mouth. It is they who will turn to you, not you who will turn to them. And I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We'll read Psalm 26 responsively. Give judgment to me, O Lord, for I have lived with integrity. I have trusted in the Lord and have not faltered. Try me, examine my heart and my mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes. I have walked faithfully with you. I have not sat with the worthless, nor do I consort with the deceitful. I have hated the company of evil doers. I will not sit down with the wicked. I will wash my hands in the innocence of the Lord, that I may go in procession round your altar singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and recounting all your wonderful deeds. Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. The second lesson for this morning is from the 12th chapter of Romans, beginning with the ninth verse. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the spirit of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. But leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel affirmation. from the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. From that time on, after Peter confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. 
And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on th divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world, but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with the angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our strength and our redeemer. I was reminded through the preaching resource Working Preacher this week about Dostoevsky's novel The Brothers Karamazov. Some of you perhaps have read it. There is a section in that novel that's entitled The Grand Inquisitor. It's a kind of parable told by Ivan, one of the brothers, and it takes place at the height of the Inquisition. Jesus has returned to earth to the Italian city of Seville. And he is arrested by the leaders of the Inquisition because he's been performing miracles and they find that a bit problematic. And then he is sentenced to be burned to death the next day. In the novel, the Grand Inquisitor himself visits Jesus in his cell as he awaits ex execution. He explains to Jesus why the church voted yes to aligning with imperial power. He says to Jesus, the church no longer needs you. You were wrong to refuse the power to feed the poor, to perform a miraculous leap off of the temple, and to grab rulership of the whole world. And here, parenthetically, he is referring, of course, to those three temptations that Jesus faced with Satan in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry. The Inquisitor continues, We picked up where you left off and improved upon what you started. In fact, we corrected your mistake. Yes, it was necessary to use the devil's principles to do so, but we do it in the name of God. What you don't understand, says the Inquisitor, is that humanity cannot handle the free will you gave them. We gave them what they really need, security from want. Jesus doesn't respond except to listen in silence throughout the interrogation. And when the Inquisitor's diatribe is finally over, Jesus silently kisses him, as the author says, on his bloodless, aged lips. The Inquisitor is quite startled by this gesture, and even perhaps a bit moved, but then not converted, not changed. He does, however, let Jesus go with a warning. Do not ever return. The parable of the Grand Inquisitor brings in bold relief the stark differences between the ways of the crown and the ways of the cross in an attempt to usher in God's realm. 
As a child, I was always confused about the phrase when someone would say, oh, so-and-so wants their cake, wants to have their cake and eat it too. Didn't make any sense to me. It seemed like if you had cake, the only reason to have it was to eat it. (laughs) Never really understood it. But as I became a little more sophisticated in my thinking, I realized that the phrase points to a much more subtle and much more insidious kind of posture toward the world. A posture that suggests that we can and should have whatever we want when we want it. When it comes to discipleship, the brothers Karamazov illustrate in very bold brushstrokes the line that the church has always wrestled with. On the one hand, how much to associate with and strive for what will make us effective, powerful, influential, and respected for the church of God. And on the other hand, how much to follow the ways of Jesus, who invited and illustrated a life of being near to those who are not powerful, who are in fact needy, those who have little or no influence or standing or even respect in society. Hence the phrase, crown or cross. When it comes to choosing the way of the cross, In lieu of the way of the powerful, which is oftentimes in the past referred to as the crown, sometimes today you hear it referred to as empire, or simply success, Christians have historically wanted to have our cake and eat it too. Have we not? Over and over again in the scriptures, we're confronted with this reality that discipleship, True discipleship, following Jesus, not just being a fan of Jesus, but following the ways that Jesus teaches about how to treat people, how to think about our own place in the world, how to embody servant leadership, is just plain hard. If it's easy for you, you can leave now. You don't need the rest of this sermon. (laughs) I think it's just plain hard. Because it goes against everything we were raised with and everything that we've been taught about what is good and worthy of our skills and our time and our attention. Peter got hit in the face with this reality in today's gospel lesson. Just minutes before, he was no doubt feeling pretty good about himself. Remember, who do you say that am? Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He gets an A. He must have been feeling pretty good about himself because not everyone else had really figured out that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. But then Jesus starts to describe what kind of Messiah he's planning to be. And the description, from Peter's point of view, and certainly from the rest of the disciples, was hideous. It was nothing like what Peter or the disciples would have associated with the images that they grew up with, awaiting for this long, cherished Messiah to appear. They had pinned their hopes on someone who would literally wear the crown, someone who would fill the power vacuum that was occupation, and turn the tables on the oppression that the Hebrew people had experienced for literally generations. The Messiah would come and upend all of that. Everyone do that. The Messiah would kick out the Romans, or at least free the people from Roman control, like Moses did with the Israelites. A Messiah had to be strong. A Messiah had to be powerful. A Messiah had to have the will and the capacity to garner the support of all of the people in order for a revolution to even begin to be possible. For a Messiah to willingly submit 
to Roman control and knowingly go to Jerusalem with the understanding that they would be killed would defeat the entire purpose of having a Messiah. No one could have imagined a God-ordained messenger who would choose such a path. Which is why in this moment, when Jesus is trying to explain to his disciples that he's not what they're imagining, Peter's comment embodies the very brick wall that is the expectation that social and military power are the only true, real, and effective power and the only kinds of power that God would use to transform the world. That whole mindset was inconceivable. Truth be told, not a lot has changed in that regard over the thousands of years since Jesus' time. The world around us still believes that money and control and manipulation of the truth Military and militarized power is the only real, effective power that actually changes the world. Right? And we, like Peter, often get sucked into believing that as well. Jesus, remembering those temptations of the evil one in the wilderness, recognized that Peter's thinking was awfully similar. Remember the devil wanted Jesus to take the power that he had access to and use it for himself. Go ahead and make those stones become bread. Go ahead and throw yourself down off the temple. Require the world around you to take care of you and catch you. You could have all the power of control over all these worlds. But Jesus said no. He could imagine what that, a yes to that would mean. He saw that distortion in that offer by the devil. And now in this moment, he sees it and hears it again in Peter, whose voice sounds a lot like the one in the wilderness. It had to hurt to be Peter and get called Satan. The shift in mindset was more than Peter had any ability to comprehend in the moment. And imagine, I imagine that any of us in Peter's situation would have said the same things. But we have this story to remind us of the shift in mindset that discipleship calls for. We have this to learn from, to be reminded of, to be called out for, to be challenged by. Because the church has said no to Jesus' way far too often, and we, like the disciples, we need to be reminded of the differences between cross and crown. We need to be aware of when we are enticed to go the way of the crown and walk away from the way of the cross. We have been raised in our society to want to be winners, to want to have it all, to have a comfortable life, to avoid pain and suffering, and sometimes that means avoiding the lives and people whose lives are filled with pain and suffering. Cross bearers in our society are losers. How many of us want to be losers? Right? It's just not in our nature. Winners are inclined to avoid anything that looks like losing. I thought it was interesting that somebody mentioned the idea of wearing a cross around our necks thinking that it symbolizes what Jesus did for us and displaying our winner self to the world. But today's text explains that cross-bearing is what disciples do in Jesus' name for the sake of the kingdom. And it reveals the truth, the hard truth, that for us to claim Jesus 
means we also need to be living by the values that Jesus displayed, the values that fixed his eyes on Jerusalem. That means sometimes we choose the hard way. Unfortunately, Peter was so busy reacting to Jesus that he didn't hear the part about heading to Jerusalem to die, but then rise again in three days. Can't you just imagine the way that conversation went? Peter pulls Jesus aside and says, come on, dude, like for real, that we cannot be talking like this, that is not Messiah talk. (laughs) Did he ever hear that part about the three days? No, and none of us would have, right? You know, two seconds after the die word, we weren't listening to anything else, and neither was Peter. But that's when Jesus was showing him the real power in the moment. God's power to defeat far more than just a pathetic Roman leader or oppression in one corner of the world, but the power to overcome death itself and destruction of all kinds. Jesus was pointing to and embodying a kind of power that was existential. And it was hard to see for the disciples in the moment. They were too close. But we have these stories to help us see it more clearly. To see that cross-bearing discipleship means intentionally leaning into the pain of the world and standing with the broken to be God's love, justice, and hope in their world. Cross-bearing discipleship means embodying the characteristics that are listed in our Romans passage today. Did you hear those characteristics? I was thinking to myself, it's time for me to type that up and put it on my refrigerator. That list in Romans 12 is worth reading every day. Genuine love for others, tenacious goodness and perseverance, even in the face of evil, patience in suffering, There's no part where it says whining in suffering, which, (laughs) anyway, I guess is a good thing. Blessing even those who persecute us. How hard is that? Our natural inclination when hit is to hit hit back. Cultivating empathy for people whose lives or situations are completely alien to us. How often do we just write something off that we don't know anything about? Okay, maybe that's just me. (laughs) Rejecting opportunities for retribution and revenge and so much more. That list is alive with the transformative power of a very unpopular kind of power, but a godly power. Cross-bearing is a standard of setting aside our own agendas for personal advancement in favor of meeting human need. It's not something that's taught in the schools. There's no degree you can earn in that category. No accolades will come from family and friends if you pass up an opportunity that seems so good for the sake of a principle or a moral or another agenda that will care for someone else. In fact, following Jesus sometimes provokes one of those well-meaning associate conversations where somebody pulls pulls us aside and says, seriously, are you really going to do this? Just like Jesus got from Peter. The irony is that to teach self-interest over the shared interest of others around us is to train people to imprison themselves in service to their self. And it's a lonely place to live. The very definition of sin is to be turned in on ourselves. But to teach one another to carry crosses of compassionate service for the good of all is not only to build a meaningful life, But it's also to train the eyes of the believer to catch a glimpse of God's eternal realm, to catch a glimpse of God actively at work in the world. The world around us still tells us that Jesus is no longer needed. Yes? 
that faith is outdated, that true power is found in self-realization rather than in service to God and neighbor. To bear the cross today is to live in ways that counter with that world counter that worldview with a compassionate kiss, silence in face of lies, an action that shows God's ways of demonstrating the power of transformation, of healing, of forgiveness, of claiming hope when the storms announce doom. Sometimes the most difficult choices we make are the choices where we cling to the cross when everyone around us is clinging to the crown. The song that we're about to sing asks several questions of us over and over again, questions that help to shape cross-bearing lives. My encouragement is for you to listen carefully to those questions, to think of them as the end of the sermon, to take them seriously, and to think for ourselves, how do I actually live? How do I answer these questions honestly? And let these questions be an opportunity for us to consider where we might find greater joy and peace in learning more fully to live in the ways of Jesus, trusting in God's surprising power to heal and transform the world, to heal and transform us, to enable us to envision and to see God at work in the world for the sake of building God's realm, no matter what else seems powerful and real.
Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the church, creation, and the needs of our neighbors. God of life, your words are the joy at the heart of your church. Draw the seeker to you, place messages of hope and hearing in the mouths of your witnesses, and open our children to your truth when we stumble. God of every trial, deliver, heal, and redeem us. God of steadfast love, renew the earth by your spirit that lands and oceans reveal the beauty of your creation. Challenge us to live humbly and peaceably as part of your world. God of every trial, deliver, heal, and redeem us. God of patience, lead those who govern to hold fast to what is good. Guide them to show honor to the people in their care. Overcome evil in all nations and grant peace to peoples and places mired in conflict. We pray especially for the people of Ukraine and Russia and Hawaii. Empower those who would rebuild and bring healing. God of every trial, deliver, heal, and redeem us. God of deliverance, remember all who are suffering, lonely, and in pain. Liberate your people being in insulted, persecuted, or in the grasp of the ruthless. Give endurance to workers who persevere on this Labor Day and ensure fair wages and safe working environments. We name before you those who are in need of your healing touch. For those in need of healing from cancer and treatment side effects, Jean Christensen, Patty Reynolds, Owen Baker, Jocelyn Murray, David, Dave Edson, Duffy Walton, Jacob Kalau and April Bryan. For those in need of healing in body, mind, soul, and or spirit, Mary Jean Schossler, Cole Lopez, Margot, Brittany Morales, Don Schneider, Stephanie Truex, Jane Christensen, and David Sanchez. God of peace, Equip this congregation to boldly follow you in uncertain times and to remain faithful in prayer when facing challenges. Show us how best to love and care for one another and our communities. God of every trial, deliver the us. For what else would the people of God pray? God of glory, we give thanks for the saints who now dwell with you in splendor. Nurture us in faith until the day we join their heavenly song. God of every trial, deliver, heal, and redeem us. Remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these and the prayers of our hearts, trusting in your compassion made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let's share a word of peace with one another. And for those online. Peace to those online. Please be seated. This morning as we take our offering, um, I just want to remind you that it's the first Sunday of the month, so we do two offerings. That's our normal routine. And today our second offering um, is uh, for the folks um, that are served by the ELCA World Hunger Program. The World Hunger Program has projects in countries all around the world 
It is very well run. I've had the privilege of seeing some of the projects in Africa and um, knowing people who've worked in them in other parts of the world, and I am always amazed at how incredibly um, mindful they are of making use out of every dime that is offered. So I encourage you to give generously as you're able today. The first offering is just our regular offering. God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring your gifts to the table that all might be fed. Form us into one body of your beloved Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. I neglected to mention as we were doing the offering, please uh, fill out the worship registration forms that are in the little colored sheets that are in the pew racks and uh, just put them in the uh, plate on the way out, if you would, please. Thank you.
share together in the feast of God's grace and love. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty, and our joy that in all times and in all places we give thanks and praise to you, mighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. Fulfilling the promise of the resurrection, you pour out the fire of your Spirit, uniting in one body people of every nation and tongue. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
Stand as you are. Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word, Jesus Christ, the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by this food, send us to gather the world to your banquet, where none are left out and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue to pray as Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We sing our sending song.